have everybody covered. Um, the announcements are on the bulletin. And this morning we welcome Reverend Susan Davenport. Um, as Pastor Thomas is back at his home church in Rembrandt, Iowa. And anybody have any announcements besides what's listed in the bulletin? Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all good. 
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. and 
and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like, shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn men into righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsibly from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the God we gather in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries and close a pleasant land. Indeed, I have rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in peace. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand there are pleasures forever. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then she adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since you have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to be together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and Creator and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As fall deepens into winter and days grow shorter, our lectionary texts ask us to look at time, how we use it, how long or short it is, where it is going, and what that tells us. And why not? Isn't dealing with time one of our greatest struggles? We begin this life, we all begin this life, as children do, with their delightful incomprehension of time. Maybe you remember yourself, or some child you know, waking up long before dawn on Christmas Day. Is it time to open presents yet? When will it be time for the countdown to a birthday? Is today my birthday? Is it today? How many more days? We will grow old, some of us. And our days may stretch out before us as we wonder how to fill our time. The time between visitors. The time between meals. The time between the great effort of getting up and the relief of another bedtime. For many of us, time is a problem because it is a limited commodity. We have to make choices about what we will do and when. Surely one of our great human questions is a question about time. And that question is when. We want to know how much time we have, how long we've got, what the deadlines are. When? Thankfully, we are not alone in asking questions that begin with when. When is the disciples' question on the day captured in today's Gospel lesson? They were in the holy city of Jerusalem looking at one of the most beautiful sights they could ever hope to see. The temple that had been built by Solomon adorned with beautiful stones and precious metals, brilliant, all dazzling in the sunlight. And Jesus, their tour guide, tour guide for the day, says, all of this, you see, will be rubble. Ruins, not a stone left on stone. When, teacher, they ask, when will this be? Give us some warning. Some sign so we can know when. One thing universal.
universally true about time is that some things must end in order for new things to begin. Our gospel lesson appointed for this Sunday is considered an apocalyptic writing. The word apocalypse means an unveiling or an uncovering of what was previously unknown or hidden. Apocalyptic literature abounds with bizarre visions and strange symbolism. Think the book of Revelation. Apocalyptic writing emerges, especially when people are in desperate situations, in times of persecution, when their faith is under attack or in danger of being abandoned for the sake of safety. Because it's written in times of persecution, apocalyptic writing often uses symbolic speech that makes it seem a sealed book to those outside the situation. What is always clear, though, is that apocalyptic writing, including chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel, which we hear just the beginning of today, is written to give hope to its readers its hearers. It's written to keep our eyes focused on God and God's actions in history and to give assurance that despite appearances to the contrary, God is still God. God still reigns. The future belongs to God. The central theme of apocalyptic literature is God's revelation concerning the coming of the fullness of the reign of God. And from the very beginning, the faith of Israel, our spiritual forebears, was oriented toward the future. God's work in history is purposeful, and events are pressing toward the realization of the divine goal for all of God's creation. History is not spinning in circles or repeating itself like the cycle of the seasons. Nor is it governed by blind fate or chance. Israel perceived that its history was part of a great divine drama, which under the direction of God is moving toward a final consummation. Jesus, like Daniel in our first reading, carries the weight of knowing the pain of what is to come for him. And how the grief and confusion of those who follow him will endure. Stones will be thrown down. One will roll away. And out of death will come eternal life. Separation will be destroyed. Connection and full relationships will be restored. There will come a love like no other, connecting us forever to the one who loved us into being. But to the disciples' question of when, Jesus responds not with a countdown or a calendar, not even with some good clues for calculation. He doesn't say when. And as for the clues, the signs, we may be surprised by how unclue-like they really are. They are so general, in fact. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines. Certainly these are not specific enough to set a watch by. In fact, they are unfortunately as predictable and familiar as if Jesus had said the sun will rise and set, spring will follow winter, and winter will follow fall. Yes, there will be wars and earthquakes and famines and plagues. There were then. One of the wars would soon bring down that beautiful temple that Jesus and his disciples were speaking about. And as we know all too well, there still are wars, earthquakes, 
famines, and plagues today. No age has been without these calamities, and sadly the time does not seem to be near when they will cease. The enemies, and strategies, and weapons, and targets change, but the constancy of the war does not. No, Jesus is not predicting the end here. He is no doomsday forecaster. Jesus does not call his disciples to forecasting either. Instead, he calls them and he calls us to faithfulness. He doesn't tell us when, but he tells us how to live, how to use our time. Redemption, someone once said, has more to it than just clipping coupons or collecting trading stamps. Redemption has to do with getting your life turned around. So whereas it was going in one direction, it is now headed another way. Often referred to religiously as a better way. Such an experience gives one the opportunity to start over again. And nobody knows who or what one might become. It is significant that rather than signs of an impending end, Jesus tells about things around us in the world, things that demand our attention as faithful people, things that entail a Christian response. Not forecasting, but faithfulness. Jesus confronts our fears of living in dangerous times. He does not promise us rescue from the world's distress. Rather, disciples are called to serve in a suffering world, bearing witness to the God who will not let suffering have the last word. Jesus gives us signs, things to watch out for, not because they help us predict how long we have, but to tell us there is no more important day than the day we now live. The wars, rumors, earthquakes, famines, persecutions remind us that there is still a need for a witness to God's love and that we are ones who can bring God's love to people who hurt. People whose lives have been torn apart when nation rises up against nation, or tribe against tribe, or people against people, or when family member rises up against family member, when hurricanes strike, or terrorists strike, when people are hungry and sick, or their lives are slipping away. Jesus gives us signs. But they are not useful signs for predicting the end. They are useful for showing us where God needs us to be. Where God is. Among the poor, the lost, the least, the lonely, the weak. Jesus tells his followers in the midst of these things not to be alarmed. Do not be terrified. Do not fill up your time with anxiety and fear. Our readings from Daniel and Hebrews both point to the reason we need not be afraid. Both point to a confidence in the ultimate triumph of God. Knowing who holds the future, we can be aware not alarmed. We can be faithful, not forecasting. What does the future hold besides war and earthquakes and famine? Are these things endless? Will every age know pain? Will time march on and on and on, bringing only so much sorrow? No. God 
holds the future. For now, we only get glimpses. For us, the author of the book of Daniel wrote, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The author of the letter to the Hebrews wrote, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. It is a generous and gracious God who holds near and dear all life, all time, all our days. So we are freed to be faithful, to live every day as if it matters. Not because it might be our last, but because God holds the last and everyone until then. We can live as if this is the most important day of our lives. Because it is a precious gift of God, an opportunity to once again show love, not fear, to be aware, but not alarmed. How do you spend time? How will you live this day? Live this day and every day knowing that God holds them all close to God's heart. And God holds you too. Amen. Rise in body and or spirit for the hymn. Number 632. Good. 
God's abundant love for the world, let us pray for our neighbors, the church, and all of creation. <clears throat> oh God, in the washing of water, you set us free from the power of sin and death. Unite all the baptized in the covenant you have made with us, that we might bring good news of your grace to all the world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. By your merciful might, you sustain all creation. Help us to see when we inflict harm on the earth and to adopt ways of life that protect and restore our planet. Merciful God, receive our prayer. With the selfless power you protect all who take refuge in you. As nations rise against nations, defend all who are disciplined or affected by war or violence. Inspire all people and nations to pursue peace. Merciful God, we see our prayer. In your presence you give fullness of joy. Care for all who form joy feels distance. Be present with persons experiencing depression, anxiety, addiction, and any mental illness. Bring healing and wholeness to all in need, especially all those on our prayer list and those we name in our hearts. And Pete, the grandstand. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Through the years you have gathered your church and this congregation for worship, fellowship, formation, and service. Give us ears to hear your voice and a willing heart to perceive where you are calling us forward. Merciful God, we see our prayer. With the thanksgiving, we remember saints and angels who delight in your everlasting presence. As their lives inspire ours, provoke us always to love, holding fast to the confession of our hope in you. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. We offer our prayers to you, gracious God, trusting in your boundless love for all that you have made through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you.
joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the witness of the saints, you show us the hope of our calling and strengthen us to run the race set before us, that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with them in glory. And so with all the saints, with the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
crucified one now risen, the indwelling one poured out. Bless you now and forever. Amen. Our hymn is 785. Peace out.